became a novice in 1978. Uh, I tried to become a ham when I was in high school, but uh, I could not master the Morse code. So I graduated from two years of college, Middlesex County College. I had a job. I had plenty of free time. Uh, no more homework. Just, you know, you come home after work, eat dinner. Uh, back then in the day, um, the Home News Tribune was the paper in my area. In, I, I grew up in East Brunswick. And Bob McGarvey ran a Sunday amateur radio column. And he announced that North Brunswick High School was running a uh, adult continuing education course, and they were offering a novice class. So, so now's my big chance. I took that. I actually mastered the Morse code this time, and I became a novice. Uh, I upgraded to uh, general in 1979, and after learning Morse code for 13 words a minute, I was prepared to leave it behind. I was going to be a 20 meter single sideband DXer. You know, this is what I always dreamed amateur radio was when I was a kid. So after I upgraded to general, I got myself a set of Kenwood twins, the R599 and the T599. Uh, I put them in the shack. I hooked them up to my antenna. I keyed the mic and I destroyed the TV downstairs for my parents, OK? Uh, after hearing some choice words about how I was tearing up the TV, um, that never happened when I was doing Morse code. Um, I was only licensed for about a year. I, I really didn't understand RFI at the time. You know, I, I didn't have an Elmer, per se. I, everything was learn by accident. So I went back to CW uh, because it didn't interfere with the TV. Uh, if I had stayed on single sideband, I would have had to Im impose my own quiet hours, not getting on the air until they finished watching TV for the night. And that wasn't about to happen. I loved amateur radio too much. So I stayed with CW, and I've, I've been a CW operator ever since. Um, as Ed said, always dabbled in QRP. I joined the QRP Amateur Radio Club International back in 1979, back when QRP was considered to be 100 watts or less. OK? That was the original QRP RC definition, that we would, we would voluntarily keep our transmitters to 100 watts or less. And then somewhere in the 1982-83 frame, it became what we now know it today, QRP. 5 watts for CW, 10 watts for single sideband. And this presentation, this is a good friend of mine. This is Jim Cluett, W1PID. And he lives up in New Hampshire. And what I would like you to pay attention to in this slide is the snow, OK? Um, we, uh, we operate outdoors all year long. OK, so first off, why QRP, OK? Um, you know, most of us stay in our shacks, and we operate at 100 watts. Why would you voluntarily confine yourself to 5 or 10 watts? Well, number one, because it's fun, OK? Number two, uh, I take it most of you, if not all of you, got your license as novices. Raise your hands, OK? Remember how much fun that was when you made that first QSO and, the, and you know, that first year of operating when everything was new and everything was an adventure? QRP is like that. Also, the FCC, OK? Nobody pays attention to this rule. But FCC asks us to run only the power necessary to maintain communications. OK, contrary to what most Italians believe, it's not 5,000 watts, OK? <laughs> You can, you can reliably uh, converse with people around the world with only five watts. And, and, I, and I've done it. I wouldn't, you know, maybe I wouldn't believe it if I didn't do it, but you can. Signal strength of a five watt signal is all things being equal, okay? You have one antenna, you have two 
two transmitters, a QRP transmitter and a 100 watt transmitter, okay? If you, to the same receiving station, if all of a sudden you switch the radios from the 100 watt radio to the 5 watt radio, on their end, your signal's only gonna go down 2S units, okay? And the math, which is the next, okay. This is math, which I'm not a math wizard. My son is in Rutgers studying biochemistry. I looked at his, at his calculus homework and my brain almost exploded. But power va varies logarithmically, and there's the formula, okay? The thing to remember is one S unit is about equal to 6 dB of change. So an increase from 500, from five watts to 100 watts is a 20 increase in power, which equals approximately 13 dB of gain. Okay, that's only two S units. So all things being equal, a 100 watt signal at S9, okay, a five watt signal is going to be S7. And that's perfectly copyable. Okay, so why do QRP outdoors? You know, why not just stay in the shack or it's nice and warm, or in the summertime, nice and cool, why would you want to go outdoors? Well, first it gets you out of the house. And if you're retired, it gets you out of your, from under your wife's busyness, right? She's probably all too grateful that you're going somewhere and doing something. It gives you, gives you a chance to engage in a little physical activity. Doesn't have to be a lot. You know, you don't have to hike up a mountain or anything like that. Just walk to your local park. It expands your thinking, and you have to overcome logistical ch uh, challenges. You have to know your equipment, okay, which is part of number four. You have to know what you need to bring, and you have to know how it's going to operate. Okay? And operating outdoors, after you've done it a few times and you've forgotten a few things at home and had to go back for them, you know, you start thinking for the next time, what do I need to bring so that I don't have to keep on making trips back home? And lastly, it's fun. It's a ton of fun. So what do you use as far as the radio goes? You, I'm, you know, most HF radios will go down to five watts, but that's not necessarily what you want to bring with you because they're heavy and they're big. So you want it to be small, but you don't want it to be so small if you're like me and you fat finger things and you have problems with typing on a cell phone, you want it to be a little bit bigger than that. You want it to be light, okay? That's the key. You want it to be light because you're gonna be carrying your equipment. You are going to be carrying your equipment in a bag. So you want it to be light. And you want it to be a miser as far as power goes, okay? You don't wanna carry a big heavy battery if you don't have to. So you want your radio to be a real power. So, like I said, it's no fun to lug a heavy radio around. You wanna be able to operate for a long time. High cost is not necessarily a factor, but as you, know, as you guys know, an amateur radio, you know, the sky is the ceiling. You could buy whatever you want, but you don't necessarily have to buy anything expensive. There are a ton of options where you can go with this. The venerable Yesu FT817, and now the FT818, its, it's, it's uh, successor, are pro is probably one of the, the, the most popular uh, mobile QRP radios out. Then you have the Elecraft, you have the KX2 and the KX3. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, and then Steve Weber, KD1JV, uh, designed quite a few radios for, for outdoor QRP. It was the ATS-3. Um, the AT stood for Appalachian Trail. He actually designed that radio to be used on the Appalachian Trail. His mountain topper for soda. And then there's the PFR-3, which is still available from QRP guys as a kit. You can build that. Then... There's a ton of stuff coming from China, as we all know. Um, the HB1B and the HB1A, which are sold by MFJ 
and then various other rigs that you can find on eBay and other sites. And there's old stuff, okay? There's the venerable Heath kits, the HW7, HW8, HW9. You have the Sierra, which was a kit that was actually designed by uh, Wayne Burdick, NK6R, who is now one of the owners of Elecraft. And the Tentec uh, monoband radios. And you can see this guy's using it in his kayak. And there are plenty of kits available if you want to roll your own, okay? And one of the best places, a couple of the best places to get kits, QRP guys, and the Four States QRP group, which runs the OzarkCon QRP conference. Um, they make the Bayou Jumper, which is a, a copy of a, a World War II Paraset radio. They have the Hilltopper, which is a monoband CW rig. They have it for 40, 20, and 30. And then this little beauty up here by QRP Labs, this is the QCX radio. This is probably one of the hottest kits to come out in the last year or two. Okay, it's an all mode, all, um, uh, it's not an all mode, it's CW and digital only right now, and it's mono band, but that kit is only $49. And it'll get you on the air with five watts. Yeah, there's also the, the bit X and the micro bit X, so we'll talk about those. But before you go off on some of the other used radios, one of the ones that I use a lot uh, is the Olicom 703. 703 looks like the 706, so if that's some form factor, same menu structure, but it's QRP, and it has a built-in tuner, which is really nice, especially if you got a portable antenna that's only in a tree, trying to get it adjusted. And Icon just announced uh, the 705. Right. Which tree, you know, that's going to be available. But right. That's you know, designed to be kind of a, an Elecraft competitor. Right. A lot of warm hole display on it, things like that, QRP range. Right? Really and in the very near future, Hans Sumner, who uh, designed the QCX, is going to be coming out with the QSX, which is going to be a 10 band all mode radio. And he hopes that it's going to come in to a price point under $200. You have your radios, now you have to work out, you know, how are you going to power them? You're not going to carry a generator with you, you're going to use a battery, okay? And we have the traditional alkalines, which can go inside some of these radios, but they're expensive, they discharge quickly, they're really, you don't want to use those. Sealed lead acid battery, they're great, they're rechargeable, they're fairly inexpensive. The downside is they're heavy, and unless you bring a small one with you, there are, there are a lot to carry. Then you have nickel metal hydride. It's not as common. It's more expensive. They're not that easy to charge. They have to be balanced in a charged mode. And then you have lithium ion, okay? It's the Rage. They're very light. They are super light. Uh, a 12-amp hour sealed lead acid battery probably weighs around six, seven, eight pounds. The same thing in lithium ion is about two pounds. Uh, they're expensive, not going not gonna to kid you there. And again, they're not as easy to charge. You have to, you have to hook them to a charger that's going to monitor all the cells and charge them in an equal balance. Sometimes you'll see them called uh, LifePo batteries, L-I-F-P-O, with them iron, iron phosphate yeah. batteries. So you have your typical SLA up there nickel metal hydride, and then lithium ion. I have one of these small ones I use uh, with my setup. A lot of the lithium batteries do have internal circuitry to back to do. Yeah. So next comes the antennas, OK? Your most important consideration, because that's what gets your signal out into the ether. There's, of course, no ideal solution. Uh, you have to compromise, OK? Size versus portability versus ease of setup versus efficiency. Um, you want a good antenna. You don't want to spend all day putting it up because you're outdoors to operate, not to set up and tear down. There's a lot of solutions to pick from, and this is the best part, okay? Probably the last frontier for amateur radio and home brewing is antennas, so you can always come up with your own. 
So when there's no trees available, what do you use? Okay, you can use a mag loop antenna, magnetic loop antenna, those work really well. You can use a buddy pole, okay, or a buddy stick. This is a buddy stick that I had on the top of my car. Here's one that's attached to a picnic table. Or you can use an end-fed wire. Uh, I was at Mount Prospect Park up in the Adirondacks, and I have a jackite 31-foot uh, foot pole that I had on a dry, as, with a drive-on mast. And I just, I just sloped it to the picnic table, and I got on the air that way. If you do have trees, okay, you can put up a conventional dipole. It's not, not easy to see, but George, KX0R, in, the, uh, in Colorado, likes to uh, put up wire yaggies. You can, it can be as complicated or as easy as you like. So in the end, there's no ideal solution. You're going to want to probably pick something that's easy and quick to deploy. Like I said before, the idea is to operate, not set up and tear down. Personally, what I like to use the best, okay, is my buddy stick on the car. I put it on one of those uh, Lakeview Tri mag mounts. And when I have it on the top of the roof with the ground plane, the thing really sings. Uh, I use a LNR par fed, a par end feds antenna for 40, 20, and 10 meters. I use the uh, the Irchi end fed 80 to 10 meters. That design is on the internet. That's uh, from the um, um, Emergency Amateur Radio Club of Hawaii. If if you uh, if you Google that, the plans are on on the internet. And it's, it's very easy to build. And then I also, I, I actually broke down and, and bought an MFJ 1982 LP antenna. It's 139 feet long, uh, but it gives you great SWR on all bands from, from 80 through 10 meters. What's the, what's the configuration of that? It's, it's an NFED, but what they recommend doing is setting it up kind of as an inverted V. So you get it up as high as you can in the middle and then run the ends not to the ground to support ropes on the ground so it's not actually on the ground. And how's it fed? It's, it's fed from the end. Uh, there's, there is a matchbox. How do you get your antenna up in the trees? Okay. You can use a bow and arrow, okay? You can use a slingshot. In New Jersey, a slingshot is considered a fourth degree weapon, especially if it, if it has the wrist brace. Um, you probably wouldn't get in trouble for using one, but if a police officer finds you and he had a bad morning, you, you probably don't want to explain it. So the easiest ways and the most legal ways to get an antenna up, uh, antenna support rope up into the trees is either using a pneumatic air gun, okay? Uh, I use one that is offered by the Joplin uh, Missouri Amateur Radio Club, okay? It's a $50 kit. It works extremely well. Uh, you can use an arborist's throw weight or a throw bag, and you can use a bottle. Uh, a, a regular old water bottle, either half filled with water, or you could put gravel in it, you could put nuts and bolts in it, whatever you need. So you have all this stuff, okay? You have all this stuff.